All right, guys, we are joined today with author Ken Barr. How are you doing? I'm great, Cassius. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much for doing it. So I guess the first thing we should talk about is the book that everybody knows you by. We are the road crew. Um, tell me about the book. What inspired it? Every guy that's been on the road ever always says, oh, this this life is, you know, no one would believe my story is I should write a book. We all, you know, we all sit around the coffee in the morning saying that, you know, or after a really bad loadout or a really great show. Uh, I've got to write a book one day. And I had left the road and I had always missed it. And I still do. Mm-hmm. And um, I got I got really sick. And it was one of these things the doctors were throwing out words you didn't want to hear because they couldn't figure it out. And I said, well, if I get through this, I'm going to write that book. I'm not putting it off anymore. And they figured it out. It ended up being a minor thing. I was 100%, and I immediately kept that promise and started. It took a year because I'd never written a book before. You know, I didn't take a class. I just sat down and said, I have stories to tell. And uh, I I started in my kitchen at 1 o'clock in the morning. I, I used to write from 1 to 3. And um, about four months in, I said, who am I kidding? I, I, I can't write a book. And I quit for a month or so. Wow. Then I picked it. <clears throat> well, I actually did that twice. I quit twice in the year. And then finally I said, you know, this is finally coming along. Let's do it. And it was a year from start to finish. And I think f- for me, the, the biggest thing was I'm not Hemingway. I'm never going to be Hemingway or any of those guys. Write it like you're sitting on a bar stool telling the stories, and that's what people are getting from it, and that's what people are liking. Some of the chapters are two pages, so it's perfect for people that are busy. You know, pick it up, read two pages. Okay, you're at the checkout at the grocery store or driving to work and stopped at a red light. You can knock out. It's like a Ramon song. Right. You can knock out a chapter in you know, two pages and get a good story and a laugh, a smile to start your day. It's not an overload. No, absolutely not. There's a lot in there, and it does cover a lot, but in really, really small bites. So it's, yeah. you know, that it, it was written for people like me that multitask, have a lot going on, and, you know, oh, you don't want to get involved. You know, we all have that book you want to read, and you find yourself, you're busy, and you scan to the end. All right, I'll finish the chapter, and then you start counting how many pages to the end of the chapter, and, and then you don't enjoy the book. And I thought, you know, let's just do what the Ramones did with music. Let's just... Short, to the point, funny story, two to three pages, we're in, we're out, we're done. Right, it's not a memoir, it's just road stories. Uh, it, it, it's a combination. It's right. my life getting on the road, which is, you know, I didn't go to a, a school and, and fill out a job application. I paid a lot of dues. Mm-hmm. So it's my memoir of getting the starting out in the clubs and bars as a kid and the stories that, you know, were part of my life, were very much a part of my life. So it's road story slash memoir okay. from my, it's my life from 1978 till 2000. Okay. Now, can I ask you what you were sick with? They were throwing. Uh, well, here's the symptoms. The um, really, really tired. I, initially, I had a fever that was 106, 107. It was one of those fevers where my doctor called us because you know we had called and left a message and he said get him to the hospital now and i thought i am not going to die in the back of an ambulance if i'm going to do it i'm staying home and i made them keep me home and uh neighbors came they helped you know and the fever broke and blah 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 after that i was getting up to get a cup of coffee i would be exhausted and i had pain right below my sternum and a little bit of tenderness Hmm. well that's where your pancreas is and we all know one of the fastest killers is pancreatic cancer. And uh, I had to get tests for a lot of things. And there were other possibilities. And um, I had to have that conversation. Okay, where do I want to travel to one last time before I'm not able to travel anymore? And that is, a you know, looking down the barrel of that shotgun is a hard, you know, that is a hard uh, discussion to have. Yeah. And I, I did. So anyway, back and forth, doctors couldn't figure it out. I'm in horrible shape. I can't survive more than five minutes standing up. And uh, I had to go uh, get an endoscopy. That's where they go down your throat with a scope. Okay. And what was funny was the night before my endoscopy, my sister called and said, I know what's wrong with you. And I said, you're kidding. She said, I just saw it on Medical Mysteries on TV, all the same symptoms. (laughs) She said, your bile duct in your pancreas is blocked. And she said, during your endoscopy tomorrow, they can clear it, and you will feel 95% better, and within a day, you'll be 100%. Wow. So I thought, 
okay, there's a discussion worth having with my doctor. So, you know, I go in, I'm getting prepped. I tell the nurse, and the nurse looks at me, rolls her eyes, says, all right, just tell the doctor. I'm sure he can't wait to hear. And I start to tell the doctor, and he said, listen, your sister's not a doctor. I've been doing this a while. I kind of know what I'm doing. I would have thought of that if that's what it was. Right, yeah. So I had the procedure. They knock you out for it. And I woke up in the recovery room, still groggy, and I thought to myself, I feel better. I feel a lot better. So they do the procedure and then? It, they actually went in and saw that my sister was right. <laughs> they cleared the blockage. And my doctor never came to see me after. He, in fact, buried that, like, page three of the report that I got when I left. Wow. My sister was right. So watching Medical Mysteries can save your life. It's worth watching. I'm going to start watching that show now and just uh, do a self-checkup every episode. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I think I think some things are so rare, so infrequent that, and and you know, doctors are human beings. I'm not disrespecting them at all, but you know, they see the same thing day in day out. And this one rare case, oh, you know, it couldn't be that. You never see that. Well, once in a while, it is that rare thing, and and in my case, it was. And I was on my feet in two days. I was 100 wow. percent back to work. Life goes on, and that's, that's when I started writing the book. Now, were you sick like this on the road with touring acts? No, I actually have always had pretty good health. I mean, you get injuries here and there, you know, piece of equipment falls or uh, because I was a, uh, more of a frontline guy, a lot of times when people come over the barrier and try and get on stage and I'm, I'm a big guy as well, I'm over six foot tall, you kind of have to get physical and sometimes you do get injured, you know, there are times I got over the barricade and smashed my legs getting dragged into the audience and it happens, but you know, there's always medical attention. I've been on the road with guys who did have major things, and they were taken care of. I had a, a, one tour, one of the riggers had a heart issue and had to go into the hospital and have a procedure done. Wow. The tour the tour paid for it, and he uh, replacement was brought out only for a while he was unable to work, and as soon as he was on his feet, he was back out. Because you have to look after your people. You really do. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on a second. So, you said you were getting dr dragged into the audience, like the audience was actually dragging you in? There were a couple of times where they you know, they were starting to climb over the barricade. You go to push back. They grab you, and they start to go. you start to go with them. I've been sucked in more than once. Oh, uh, the flow there was, of the crowd. Yeah, well, the flow of the crowd, they're getting grabby. They're fighting. They want to get on stage, and you're keeping them off. Well, then they're like, well, you're coming in then, and you know, then you're fighting for it to get the heck back out of there. There was one show, you know, it's back in 1990, it was an Alice Cooper tour, and we were doing European festivals, and security in 1990 is nothing like it was now. Mm -hmm. Well, the guitar player I was working for he turns to me, and he's got a steel-tip dart sticking out of his guitar. Someone was in the audience throwing steel-tip darts. <laughs> so then I, I go to look, and a knife whizzes past my head and sucks in the wall. Wow. So I, you know, I, I start watching the, now this is, you know, this is no time to call security. This is, we got to deal with this right now. And I, I finally was able to spot the guy as he was getting ready to throw another one. And I went in the crowd after him. I was stuck in there for about a song and a half, just trying to grab, you know, wrestle him. People are punching in and our security finally, you know, one of the times I kind of raised up grabbed my legs and started pulling me and I had him in a headlock. He came up with me because there was no way he was walking out on that one. No, when so, you're trying to kill the band, you don't really leave when the, the roadies get involved. No, no. If it, if it gets physical, it's going to get physical. And I actually, I mentioned that in the book. You know, uh, I was always one of the first people out there when key, people would come on stage. I would try to get my arms around them and grab them and get them out of there because if they get past me, there's road guys on every side of that stage with those big mag lights ready to beat the living hell out of you because right. that's because that's trespassing and also what you know what people don't realize is you know they get up on stage they've worked hard they feel it's you know this is what's the big deal this is my chance well they go running toward their favorite rock star and they're excited they don't realize and boom they collide now that you know your rock star is down possibly injured and everybody goes home that's why we take it so seriously yeah, well, of course. And, and my the thing I always wonder with that is, what do you think you're going to accomplish by running on stage during a show? You think they're going to sign an autograph and call, you know, your sister who's a huge fan? Like, what, what's it going to do? I think it's more just caught up in the moment. It's there's my hero, my favorite, my everything. And let me try just to touch, just to, you know, people really put value on that. 
But if you really value that person and, you know, appreciate their body of work and you're a fan, then let them do their job. You know, yeah. no one wants some stranger running through their cubicle at their job getting all pushy and grabby. But the guy up on that stage, he's doing his job and he's giving you what he can. You know, you can't take more than he's already giving you. And I think that's what it comes down to a lot of times is just caught up in the moment and let me try. Well, yeah. And I mean, if you really want the experience, get a meet and greet. I mean, not everybody can get it, but I, you know, it's wrong. It's funny. I saw a video of Paul Stanley back in, I'd say the 80s, and a fan ran on stage and he was very nice, shook his hand, said, how's it going? And then there's one from 2013 where the fan runs up and Paul kicks him with a seven inch boot. (laughs) Times have changed. Yeah, you know, it's dangerous. It it really is. And, and, Rock stars are human beings. They have good days and bad. Yeah. And and also, you know, when you've been doing it as long as Paul Stanley, you know how to read somebody. Mm-hmm. And you know what you're in for before they even come near you. So the person he shook hands with, he is experienced enough to know, hey, this guy is is going to be cool and I can defuse the situation. Other people, you can't defuse. And it, yeah. it it's going to get ugly, so let's nip it in the bud, you know? Yeah. And it's just what you have to do. I mean, I think that if you get up on stage and the crew come out, it's time to call it done. Let's not fight the crew because there's more of them and they're more than happy to come out and kick your ass. Yeah. You know, and, and it goes again, you know, those, all those people are enjoying the Kiss show and now they got to deal with, you know, an altercation in the middle of what could be their favorite song. You know, mm. and, and a, a Kiss performance is so theatrical, you don't want it marred by that, you know. It's a, a, a seamless production of, of just. You know, lights, costumes, fire, sound, everything. You don't need, you know, Joe Fan or Lady Fan jumping in the middle of it. It's like, you know, this ain't Walmart. Get off the stage. <laughs> That's right. That should be. I a like quote. the picture. That is that Kiss seventy seven Japan on that picture behind you. That's right. And I also got the Empire State photo shoot. That is awesome. And Those Space are two Invader. very. Cool. Oh, that's Ace Freely. Yeah, the new album. It's the new one. That's awesome. I love the Kiss Japan. Actually, I was a Kiss fan back then, and I didn't have a kimono, but I had a bathrobe. So I started walking around the house with my jeans on and my bathrobe. And my <laughs> parents thought I was retarded, but I thought I was like, you know, Gene Simmons in Japan. That's this a lot is of how Kiss we dress. Fans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it wasn't just me. So tell me, you were working with Kiss for a couple years, right? 92 to 96. Yes, I did. Tell me about how you first uh, met the band and how you first got the gig. I was on tour with Alice Cooper, and I was a guitar tech and keyboard tech, and Eric Singer was in the band. And I had known Eric from Badlands. Uh, I was friends with the guy that was teching for him. I actually helped Eric set up his drums when he auditioned for Alice Cooper, which was in January of 1990. And it was obvious he was going to get the gig. He just – he had what Alice wanted. And he's still – I think – I'm pretty sure he's um, Alice's favorite drummer still. He's a pro. But – you know, yeah, and he, and he's just he's he's a hundred percent all the time. Yeah, you, and as we talk, you, I'm going to start to sound like the president of the Eric Singer fan club because I just you know he's a great human being and a good friend and a great drummer. Yeah, no. So problem. anyway, uh, Eric knew I could do drums, and actually there were times when his tech was having issues where I would help with his drums. You know, it's, it's just what I did. And um, when Eric got the the gig, you know, when Eric Carr passed. Which was a very, very sad thing. Eric was a great guy. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, Eric, you know, we, we all knew because Eric had already played on Revenge and was going to go uncredited. And we, obviously that changed. And um, Eric and I went out to dinner one night. And I had a feeling. And it was one of these where we, we kind of danced around it through most of dinner. And then he, he you know, he kind of hit me with, hey, um, by the way. And I said, oh, you know. I had a feeling you were going to get the kiss gig. He said, yeah, and I want you to come with me. I want you to be my guy. And I said, I'd be honored, Eric. And that night we mapped out what we were going to do. I was going to, we were going to finish the tour. And in January, I was going to fly out to Los Angeles. I was still living in New York at that time. I'd stay at his house and we were going to go to the the NAMM show, the North American Music Merchants, where it's a big convention. I'm sure you've heard of it. And I met all his vendors, you know, his drum company and all the people I'd be dealing with. And that was a great thing. And, and of course, everybody loves Eric because he's, he's not only just a great drummer, he's consistent. You know, the people that sponsored him day one, he is still, he's still with Pearl Drums. Yeah. You know, he's, he's really lo- fiercely loyal, and as he was with me. So uh, we, we nailed all that down. And then I think rehearsals were going to start in April. 
for, for at a point where I would come in. It was just you know small room mates or or square D. I can't even remember, but a little room. So I flew out again. I think it was in April, and now I was officially part of the crew. And Eric met me out outside the studio and walked me in. And I tell you, as a Kiss fan, that was one of the most intimidating days of my life. That's huge. Because oh, it's it's, it's massive. Yeah, I'm, I'm standing outside. It's like Dorothy outside of Oz or something like that. I just well, I, I'm part of me is going, is this real? I'm I'm about to meet not not just meet Kiss. I'm about to become a part of the organization. Right, a part of the machine. It's like, yeah, you know, so uh, I, I walked in with Eric and he introduced me. Paul walked right up, put his hand out and said, hi, I'm Paul. Nice to meet you. And Gene was over uh, sitting on a couch and Eric walks me over and he said, Gene, this is my tech, Ken. And Gene looks at me and he said, you're going to tech for him? And I said, yeah. And he just looked at me and said, why? <laughs> and he had that deadpan Gene face. And I, I had nothing. So I just kind of shrugged my shoulders and walked on over to the drum kit and started working. No, no, I had no what does he mean, why? I, he's just breaking balls, I think, you know. <laughs> they like to push you. They like to see. They like for you to push back, you know. Mm. They like the strength of it. And it, it's a certain amount of camaraderie over time. Um, I did get Gene's respect in my time with him. I did get compliments from him, which, you know, he's not really a compliment giver because – his his mindset and it's mine as well is you're paid to do a job I expect you to do it well, right. but I cared I truly cared about what I did so sometimes I'm sure that came through and and there were you know a few times he complimented me on what I had done and I appreciate that you know they're great guys yeah. uh, I hear people saying otherwise and that's that's not right it's um they they care they they give a shit they're loyal I was brought back more than once and and. When the reunion happened, I was brought in as a, a set carpenter slash effects guy because Gene w liked me and my work ethic. And it was an area I wasn't familiar with, but they took a chance on me okay. and because obviously out of respect to Peter Chris, he brought his guy in with him. And it didn't work out. It wasn't a good fit. It was not my background, and that tour needed someone better. And it was a mutual and a, a amicable, okay, this this doesn't work. And that was awesome. You know, it was the perfect way to go. I ended up back out on Alice Cooper doing uh, guitar teching, which is my background. But that just shows the loyalty that they you know, were willing to go to those lengths, you know, to try and teach me things, skills I, I did not have at that time. Right. So I, the parting was good, and I'm still very good friends with everyone. And uh, I go see them when they come to town. Uh, there's a, a couple of guys left on the crew I still know. You know, there's been some turnover. But it, it was a great run. I, I teched for Gene and Peter as well as Eric Singer on the Unplugged thing. Wow. And that was a, a lot of stress, a lot of worry. Um, I actually helped Gene pick out the bass because we needed an acoustic bass. You know, we'd been doing the convention tour all summer long, and they did an Unplugged set, but Gene still used an electric bass through a small amp. Mm -hmm. It was just his preference. And Unplugged, you know, you had to comply. You had to have an, un, an acoustic instrument. And... You know, Gene and I talked about it over the summer tour because it was important, and he wanted to start bringing out basses one by one and try them through his amp while we were doing these unplugged shows. And I said, Gene, it's going to feed back. It's going to be horrible, and you're not going to truly get the sense of the instrument. And he's, and he's, he's just said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I think we should get 10 or 15 basses and have them at the first day of rehearsal and go through them. And I said, when we find the one, we're both going to know it. Yeah. And he just pointed at me, and he said, can you make that happen? I said, yes, and he just said, done. And it did not ask about it again. First day of rehearsals, I had a dozen bases for him, and we had bases from the very low end through to $8,000 gorgeous handcrafted instruments. And the best-sounding one was the Kramer bass, which was low of the lower end ones, but it had balls. It's an acoustic yeah. instrument that just – it had the gene growl, and – you know, he kept going back to these other instruments that he, you know, they were wonderful, but, you know, maybe for somebody else. Not, they were not for Gene. And he kept going back to that Kramer, and I said, Gene, that's the one. We just got to find a spare for you is all, because there weren't a lot of them around. And, you know, he kept going back and forth, and he went with it. And, you know, it sounded great, stayed in tune all the, the whole show, and we never had to change with a spare. You know, but that was another thing that being a Kiss fan – 
it was an advantage because I knew what Gene wanted. Yeah. Um, you know, we would have uh, uh, Kiss tribute bands do the convention tour, and I would sometimes help them out. And there'd be, you know, a Gene imitator doing the um, the bass thing bef- with, with the spitting of the blood with right. the Roland Space Echo. You know, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Well, they, you know, obviously it's a rotary and an analog uh, piece of equipment, and they, you know, it had to be operated by somebody. Well, I knew how it was supposed to sound. I, at that point, already seen Kiss live. I'd seen the videos, and I'd go back there, and I'd run their little space echo for them, and they'd be like, dude, that was perfect. I'm like, yeah, I know. I've seen this about a thousand times. It takes a fan to do it in certain instances. I mean, people shit on Tommy Thayer for being a fan in the band, but I've heard Paul say, like, listen, he's he was a Kiss fan before this. He knows what Kiss wants, what the sound is. It's the same with you as a roadie on the road. You know, you knew what they wanted, and you were a fan, and, and you were determined to make that happen right. Oh, absolutely. Abs- and, and not just with Kiss. You know, when I was brought into Alice Cooper... Um, Al Petrelli was the guitar player, and he was an old friend. I wasn't able to do the first leg of the tour or the rehearsals. So, the, again, the, the Alice Cooper people, who are also very, very loyal, and they've been great to me over the years, they uh, they said, okay, we'll get somebody for the first leg, but then when you fly out, you're coming in cold, and you're running his pedal board you know, on the side of the stage. Well, I knew all the Alice Cooper songs because, again, I was a fan. Alice Cooper and Kiss were my two hugest things when i was a kid so the first night of course i was nervous it was a big audience it was my first night but mm-hmm. i ran the pedal board did everything because i knew the songs and i loved the songs yeah and when you, you, when you uh i'll put uh, well back in my club days this is a good story for how one thing can lead to another i took a one-off gig with a band named talus and i don't know if you've ever heard of them no they are the they are the band that billy sheen was in when david lee roth found him for his solo tour back okay. in 85. Billy is one of those, the two-handed, he's in Mr. Big now. Um, I'm getting an internet connection problem. On my, oh, it just went away. So yeah, it, it's fine now. So anyway, um, you know, when Billy left the band, pretty much the band was decimated, and it was the original singer and whoever, and Al happened to be in the band. A friend of mine got the gig as the drummer, and so I was brought in with him. And then they said, well, we need a guitar tech. Do you know anybody? So I slid over to guitar, and uh, my friend Charlie Milton came in, and he, he did drums. And um, I did the show. Al and I were like brothers ever since. So a bunch of club gigs later, I ended up doing a couple of tours here and there, but Al got the Alice Cooper gig. Uh, Al was close with Steve Vai. Steve Vai had done the record. Steve recommended Al, and Al could play. Al it was and is an amazing guitar player. I don't know if you're familiar with him. No. He's a, was in he was in Megadeth. Okay. He is currently in Trans Siberian Orchestra, and he has been since the, its inception. Um, a bunch of other stuff and a lot of records, but great guitar player. What a great name and that is, Trans Siberian Orchestra. It is cool. Have you ever seen the show? No, I I would if I you know is that you just look that up and you'll find it. Yo, you absolutely will. Trans Siberian Orchestra, they have, uh, they do a Christmas show every year. And it's a Christmas show with a kiss feel because they've got platforms, they've got pyro like you've never seen. Yeah. They've got an orchestra, they've got um, Chris Caffrey, who's from Sabotage. They've got wonderful, amazing musicians. Just um, when we're done here, go on YouTube and, and just watch some of their stuff. It's a, they have a presentation of, at Christmas that they do, a full Christmas show. It's original music. And, and some classics that they have revamped. And then they have another production they do in the spring called Beethoven's Last Night. It's classical music meets rock and roll meets Kiss to Sounds me. Sounds awesome. Yeah, you will you will truly love it. As a, a Kiss fan, you will love it. You know, they have um, a platform out at the soundboard. And at one point in the show, the guitar player and violinist run through the audience up on the platform, 30 feet in the air with fire going off. <laughs> and it's just... And you wow. and it's Christmas music. It's it's wonderful. It's a, an amazing presentation. Yeah, you you definitely will love it. You're gonna be a new fan. I, I promise you. But um, anyway, uh, Al got the uh, the Alice Cooper gig, and that's how I got it. You know, Al brought me in as soon as he could, as soon as I was able to free myself up. Okay. So that's how I met Alice Cooper. Um, just hey, Alice, I'm your new guitar tech. Nice to meet you. <laughs> and at that, that point, simple. you know. It was that's it. Really, is funny how it happens. Once it starts to happen, it's it's incredible. It was like for me, it was like a freight train 
that just never stopped because I had made so many inroads as a kid in the clubs and I knew so many people and I'd learned how to do pretty much any instrument. I would be finishing up something and, oh, a bass player and drummer I know just got into Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. They're going out. You know, and it would always fit right exactly into the, whatever openings I had. And and then once I started really touring, you know, a, a production manager I knew and had worked for was doing Stone Temple Pilots in 94. So, and he, they were having trouble with their guitar tech. And on the day's notice, boom, I'm flying to Miami. I'm working with Stone Temple Pilots for the next six months. <laughs> And it just it kept going like that. It was an amazing. It was like like I said, like a freight train. It was like I'd get a new gig here and there, and then Alice would go back out, or Kiss would go do something. And it was it was great. It it truly was. Like I said earlier, I I loved it. I miss it every day, and it was a wonderful experience. So Alice was always your constant act. Uh, from eighty nine ninety when I started, um, I did. He toured eighty nine ninety ninety one. Then he took – he didn't work for a bit, and I did other things. But from 96 to 2000, I did Alice every year. And he continues to work every year. Yeah. Whether he's got a record out or not, he puts on such a quality show. His band are that good. Uh, I, I was not able – because of film festival commitments I had this year, I haven't been able to see the show. But people I know that were Motley Crue fans went and saw Alice for the first time this tour and said – Alice blew Motley Crue off the stage. I, and I haven't one of the even guys, seen the show, and I think he should be headlining. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, he's, he's, he's got no ego, so he's okay going on first. One of the tours I did with him, he opened for the Scorpions, and I remember him saying, this is great. I'm done at 9 o'clock. I'm back at the hotel. I can have dinner. This is great. So, And, and what I was going to mention is uh, one of the guys I grew up with in the clubs of, U of New York has been in Alice's band for three years now, Tommy Hendrickson. You know, another one, you know, grew up with him, great guy, true musician, and he uh, co-produced the last record, and, you know, he's, his talent is being being seen. Awesome. So, um, yeah, so it's good when it all comes full circle. Somebody I grew up with and an organization like Alice's that I've known, you know, and been a part of that family, and they're, you know, it all ties in together. It's kind of nice. Yeah, I'd imagine it would be. One thing I want to know from you is, you know, something I've been thinking about, it's not like you can just go out uh, to each different, you know, store per se and hand out a resume when you're trying to do roadie work. Um, how do you get respect in the world of doing road work in rock and roll? Well, you, first off, you have to know your skills and the best. They have schools now and some are good, some are not so good, but you need to be selective. You need the skills. But that being said, you need the skills not just in a in a clinical studio environment. Oh, the guitar rig just died. You if you can do that in front of a live audience with a screaming guitar player, and I think work in the bar circuit, the club circuit, whatever is near you where you live, because you're going to be forced to learn everything. When I was a kid, I, I did lights, I did sound, I learned how to do drums, I did guitars. And it's a lot easier to fix a guitar rig in front of 20 people yelling at the bar than 20,000. You know, I had a gig with Stone Temple Pilots where Dean's guitar rig died, and I, it took me five full minutes to get it going. Wow. And those were the longest five minutes. Of, there was about 20,000 people booing me. Dean's yelling. He's not happy. The tour manager gets up there, and he thinks yelling in my other ear is going to make this go faster. <laughs> yeah, that'll definitely and, help. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that, of course. Let's get more people screaming. 20,000 isn't enough. <laughs> so you, you need the skills. And, and more than that, you need the attitude. Because too many people with great skills go out, have a, an attitude like party time or just, you know, I'm a, I'm a rock and roller now. I can throw a TV out the window, too. Or, mm. or, and you can't. You know, you have to live and work with these people. So you need to be respectful and good at what you do. But it's also important to... I've met so many people, oh, I want to get on the road. What do you do? Well, I do everything. Jack of all trades, master of none doesn't get you on the road. Being really, really good at something is what will get you on the road. So it's important to, to, to find a skill that you feel you would be good at, that you would like, and could become passionate about, and then pursue that. And pursue every opportunity you can. If there's a seminar, go do it. If there's a gig with a band and they can't pay you, go do it. 
I did many gigs for free or for ten dollars or for a hamburger, and I had a day job. I mean, I would go from one to the other without sleep, but. I always felt that that was how I was going to get my first break because you never know where it's going to come from. You literally never know. Right. I was a, a kid working the heavy metal hard rock bars of Long Island, and my first tour, my first real tour, like get on a tour bus and don't drive the truck, was with a pop singer named Debbie, Debbie Gibson doing drums and percussion. Mm. Well, I'd already learned how to do drums, and I went to a store and, and learned how to do percussion, and I got the gig, and that was my foot in the door. But – Again, you know, you, you need to you need the skills right. because anybody can set up, you know, a guitar, a, a half stack and, you know, a couple of guitars. But when it dies, you know, you can't scratch your head and go, hmm, what could that be? I used to run things through my head. OK, if it does this, what am I going to do and where am I going to keep the spare? And what if it does this or that? And I would spend the entire show. I'm not smiling and dancing and happy and rocking out to the song. I'm watching my musician. Because if it starts to sound not right, he's going to notice before I do. Yeah. Especially Al Petrelli could hear the slightest deterioration of his tubes. And there were times I retubed his preamp in between songs uh. because it needed to be done. Do you think the so audience he, really notices that, though? It, it doesn't matter because your guy needs a certain sound. He needs, you know, I'll, I'll describe it to you the way Eric Singer described his drum kit to me. He said, I want my drum kit. Like you ever get in your car and you've got all the mirrors and the seat and everything's adjusted just perfect and it's it fits and everything's comfortable. That's it. Mm. That goes for any musician out there on that level. They know how it's supposed to sound. And if it doesn't sound the way they need it to sound, they're not playing at their best. So you're not doing your job. So you serve the audience, obviously, because they pay all of our salaries. But you serve your musician as well. And if he ain't happy. Ain't nobody happy. It affects everyone. It does. It does. And he's got a right to have it sound the way he wants. You know, your musician has worked hard to get where he is. It's just probably harder than you have as a crew guy. Yeah. And if he wants it to sound X, Y, and Z, then it needs to do that. And if it doesn't, then it's your fault. And you're not doing your job. You know, that's why it's competitive out there. It really is. You need to be good at what you do and alert you know, I, my eyes would never leave my musician. And that was one of the things Gene liked about me when I teched for him on the, uh, on the summer tour doing the Unplugged shows. Uh, my eyes would go between him and Eric Singer. That was it. You know, I'm not checking out chicks. I'm not ordering a beer. It's, you know, if his, if his instrument ain't sounding right, he's going to start making faces before he starts yelling. And I'm going to see those faces and do something about it. Right. The little subtle cues. Now, it must have been hard to keep your eyes on them with the take it off girls walking around. Well, that depends. I mean, well, that that tour, I was only working for Eric and that tour. Initially, we would get different girls from every town and some of them, you know, Eric would kind of start peeking at. So I would kind of, you know, lose my game face for a minute and I would kind of. But then there were ones you would just wish would go away because you think is that's the best this town has to offer. I need to leave right away. <laughs> there were there were women out there. I would have paid. We all would have paid for them to put their clothes back on. <laughs> put it so on. That, yeah, put it on. Yeah, exactly. So that's why we actually started carrying three three girls ourselves on tour just for the consistency because. Too many of those small towns. I guess the best stripper in town was somebody's stepmom, and she just wasn't having a very good night. So, and once we had the same girls, you know, it, it becomes a job. It's like, oh, there goes Fiona, there goes Cheryl, oh, yeah, whatever. One of them was you know, Rachel, so that, right? Rachel Chava? Uh, I think Rachel, I, I'm sorry, I, I know it sounds horrible, but I don't know any of their last names. They they really stayed to themselves, the three of them. And okay. uh, I guess I should also say that when the word was given to us that we'd be carrying three girls on the tour to do that, nobody's wife was happy. And <laughs> oh, there was yeah. a three... It was a three bus tour, and everyone's wife was concerned what bus they were going to be on. And thankfully, they weren't on mine, so I didn't have to hear too much about it. <laughs> Whose bus were they on? They ended up with the production crew, production manager, stage manager, rigger, all the people that were in first. Just because of the layout of the buses and the situations, it just that's how it worked out. Okay. And I think the production manager might have had a thing for one of them. I'm not sure. Wouldn't surprise Maybe. me. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I think it was they a were fun pretty tour. It was a great tour. We had great opening acts. Um, we had on one leg we had uh, Trickster and Faster Pussycat, and the other leg we had Trickster and Great White. 
and the shows were good the bands were good all the crews got together and, and we're all friends uh some old friends of mine were for trickster so i'd hang out with them and it was a great experience i think the, that leg of the revenge tour lasted about neighborhood of like two and a half months or so um the real kiss fans will kick my ass for not knowing the exact amount of days but it was it was a great experience and we were playing the big rooms we recorded a live three okay so i'm going to start telling you about my favorite kit one of my favorite kiss stories to tell all right um uh, when I was a kid, I remember riding my bicycle down to the library and getting the Alive record because you could borrow records, which was awesome back then. And um, I, I remember listening to Alive, and it was amazing. You know, there's nothing like a live record. So a couple years later, Alive 2 comes out, and I would sit there with the double gatefold vinyl open, big concert shot, and read the crew's names. And I knew every crew guy on there. You know, and I remember sitting there in my room listening to, you know, Christine 16 or, or the guitar solo and shock me and just thinking, man, to be on the road with these guys. And then I'm looking at a live two and I'm going, you know, if I could be on a live three, that would be like the culmination of everything I ever wanted. Wow. And 15 years later, there I was a live three came out. I actually went to the store to buy it because I wasn't going to wait for them to send me one. And there I was that kid, you know, with the bicycle 15 years later on the live three so that was everything coming full circle for me that was a big deal that's really cool. another yeah another you know another high point from the revenge tour because i knew the record would do well and i think it did pretty well and um and i was on it so that you know that's something i'll always have that's so cool so you know it shows that dreams do come true in so many ways right they absolutely do i think you you you, you know I, I, i'm gonna get corny here because what i said was corny that's okay <laughs> no okay well you know, a lot of the kiss songs are are anthems about don't give up and, and you look at what they've done it's easy to look at them now as rock stars but when they were putting that makeup on 40 years ago that was that took a lot of nerve to do that so what I, the corny story um I had a, a bit of a, a low point in my life in around 1982. I was working in a sheet metal factory, you know, not making any money, not happy. Just everything was not was, and I'd be working on metal or boxing something up. And that from the Elder record, they have a song called "I." Yeah, and it goes, "I believe in me," and the, you know, the the verses are great and all. It's a little bit of a corny song, but that song got me through that point in my life because when my day was getting really bad. I would, you know, I'd sing that to myself. I believe in me, and I can do it. And six months later, I got out of the sheet metal factory, and you know, things started to roll. Two years later, I'm doing a lot of shows. But that song, it, it really does mean something. And it's, you know, I know it's not one of their big selling records. It's the one that everybody groans. Oh, not the elder. <laughs> but that song had value. And you know, how many other people found value in that and were able to change their lives? I could very easily still be in that sheet metal factory. But I'm not because I was sitting there with that one song going, I believe in me. You know, it's it's too easy to give into depression or to say, oh, that's too hard. I'll, I'd never be able to do that. That's a bunch of crap. Yeah. Because, if, you know, there I was a kid from Long Island, which is the eastern part of, of uh, well, you know, it's off, off New York City. It was nowhere. I lived in a little town where the grocery store closed for the winter. You know, it was an IGA. There was nothing there. And – through a lot of hard work and some luck and connections, you know, I, I, I look at the leapfrogging I did from gig to gig to eventually get to that. And what are the chances, if you think about it, of a kid, you know, any kid going from looking at a live two to being on the live three? It, it, dreams do come true. And, and anybody with a dream, you know, all I would say is, Follow it because the worst thing you can do is not try and wonder if. If is a horrible word, and yeah. that's something you carry forever. You know, it's better to go down swinging and know you tried, you gave your best, than to sit there and think, well, I could have, should have tried, and I didn't. You know, that's like I said, if is a very bad word, or what if is it, just like I said, better to know you gave it all, and and you know, I, and that's that's kind of how I with you know, with the short movies and the books, and even writing the road crew book. You know, what if? Well, I don't think I can do it, but I'm going to do it. And, you know, now here you and I are, are talking. And, you know, who knows where this will lead? I mean, could lead either of us to a million places, and that wouldn't have happened. You yeah. know, I've done a few podcasts. I've met some great people. And, you know, it, it's all about following up on the dreams. You know, I keep looking at that picture from Japan. I had that same exact picture on my wall. I love it. And those guys, 
those guys were more than musicians. They were heroes. They were superheroes back then. Yeah. Um, you know, no one knew what they looked like under the makeup. That was a big part of the mystique. But they were four guys that had a dream, and they were the walking embodiment of your dreams can come true. And you know, I, I love that picture. I had that. I had the big six foot tall Gene Simmons, and oh. you know, the Ace with the smoker guitar, and. It was, you know, it's all about that, about believing in yourself. And they've got a lot of songs that, that go through that. And that's oh, yeah. why I keep I, I, I keep repeating that, to, you know, and I, I know it's redundant, but it's it's important, you know. Never never give up because you, it, you could surprise yourself, you know. I remember walking into Stabler Arena. We'd done sh some shows in the U.K. with the Hot in the Shade set. We'd done the club tour, which was Mayhem. But walking into that arena the first day, part of me was was I felt like I was home and I had earned this. But part of me was scared, and I thought to myself, you know, what on earth did I do in my life to, that led me here? And there you are. They're building the Statue of Liberty with a Terminator underneath of it, <laughs> and you're about to go and you know do one at work for one of the biggest bands in the world. So it's insane. Yeah, yeah, it was. But it was an awesome kind of insane, yeah. and I'm so thankful for it. You know, I mean, I'm thankful to the guys to give me the chance, especially Eric. Eric went out on a limb. You know, I'm sure the Kiss guys had other people they could have used easily. They could have pushed it. But, yeah. you know, Eric wanted me, and he stood up, and, you know, so I'll always owe him for that. But all the guys were great. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show, Ken, and sharing these awesome stories. It's crazy to hear stories from, you know, somebody who is behind the scenes, um, you know, writing a book, talking about it on podcasts, because it's, you know, sometimes people don't even realize that it's not like they just walk up there, the bands and do it by themselves. There's a whole crew of people back there making this happen. Oh, there's like a whole little city, a whole little civilization traveling yeah. from town to town. Yeah. With Kiss, well, thank like a small you, army. <laughs> well, yeah, the Kiss army. That's right. Well, thank you for having me, Cassius, and I'd love to come back if ever you uh, yeah. find yourself in need of a talkative guest because I've got a whole lot of ground I haven't even covered yet. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely have you back. Um, I, before you go, I just want to um, remind the listeners that there's a special offer. If you want to get the audio book, uh, We Are the Road Crew, Volume 1 by Ken Barr, free with my trial, you can go to audibletrial.com slash kid and get your free audio book from Audible, and that is Ken Barr. So you can try out Audible and then maybe buy the book while you're at it. So uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the plug. And let's not forget it's available on Amazon and Kindle. That's right. <laughs> Make sure to buy it uh, wherever you'd like. Is, is it um, in bookstores as well? No, uh, I have self-published, and uh, unfortunately – that's just how the the economy is. It's so hard for new authors to get published. So I have self-published and it's internet and Kindle only and the audiobook, as you said. Right. I'm working on it. So maybe you know, maybe in the, in the future, but for now, Amazon's your best bet. All right. I'll have a link in the show notes and the website. Again, thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. Can you just send me a link when you put this up, please? Cash yeah, us? for sure. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Hope that we do this again soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.